Welcome to our program, The Future of Healthcare. We are so honored to have with us Dr. Vas Narasimhan, who will speak with Marcus Detam after a brief introduction by Robert Jifra. I'd like to thank all of the young leaders who are on today's call. We have 95 young leaders. We have 150 participants on both sides of the Atlantic. And I'd like to have a special shout out to Ambassador Ed McMullen and former um, Surgeon General of the United States, Jerome, Jerome Adams. Both Ed and Jerome are young leaders. They recently completed their service to the government in the United States, and we're greatly uh, proud of their service. Novartis has long been uh, a major supporter of the American Swiss Foundation, one of the great companies of the world. And we have six uh, Novartis young leaders on our call today, and we are we are great, grateful for Novartis' support. We are honored today to have one of the great CEOs of, of the world. Uh, Vaz Narasium um, became the CEO of Novartis and, and two years ago at the, at the ripe age of 41 years old. And um, he was born in Pittsburgh. And America is a land of immigrants. My, my grandparents were immigrants. And um, Vaz, his parents uh, immigrated to the United States from, from India. And he is a true American success story. His father was a chemist. And his mother was a nuclear scientist. So I can only imagine what went on at the dinner table in that house. You've got a lot of serious brain power. Whenever anyone is a nuclear a scientist, I always, you know, that's like the ultimate, uh, the ultimate uh, position. Um, after growing up in Pittsburgh, he went to the University of Chicago. Then he went to Harvard Medical School. He is a doctor. Then he also went to the Harvard JFK School. Uh, and, um, and while in the summer, uh, really worked to try to do a lot of good. And among other things, he um, fought malaria in Gambia and also child poverty in India. Uh, after, after medical school, he worked for the World Health Organization. Then he went to McKinsey and he rose through the ranks at Novartis and is now the global head, what became the global head of drug development and then uh, became the CEO. I'd like to turn it over to Marcus Diethelm Marcus is a dear friend. Uh, he is the chairman of the Swiss Advisory Council. He's my partner in everything we do with the American Swiss Foundation. And he is the general counsel, as many of you know, of the great global bank, UBS. So Marcus, uh, it's up to you now. Take it over for the questioning of Vaz. Thank you, Vaz, for participating today. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you very much, Vaz, for um, spending time with us. Um, I'd like to start out with um, something that UBS is focused on, which is finding its purpose, uh, which is not that we have to invent it, we just have to uh, find who we really are. And I understand just about a week after you became the CEO, uh, one of your coaches left a book uh, trying to strip you from your title. The book is, has the title of Unboss, uh, coordinated by Lars Collin. And you know, it's about being serving leaders and accountable associates. And it is really about flipping the pyramid. Um, I know it's very, very attractive because we're all going into a world of uh, data science and digital and sometimes hierarchies or that which we've done for over a century, in your case, a culture of doctors and scientists need to change to bring out innovation. But can you tell us a little bit about the uh, attention? And I'm sure everyone in the campus or elsewhere has talked about Ambos and has uh, wondered whether the org chart uh, is, is being tossed out. But what motivated you to take the title of the book uh, to start your, you know, your journey um, on, on finding the purpose of your company? You could say a few words about that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. And and uh, I also want to first start off by saying I'm very grateful for the invitation today. Uh, thank you to Bob and Patricia. Also want to say hello to the Novartis colleagues on the line, but also all of those who joined. Uh, hope hopefully I can provide some insights that, that might be helpful. You know, on the question of our cultural transformation at Novartis. You know, it really goes back for me in my leadership journey to actually a time around 2009-10 where I was exposed to 
uh, some writings by uh, an author named Daniel Pink, who actually previously worked in D.C. and various uh, you know, White House administrations. And he summarized what had been decades of research, which indicated pretty clearly, at least in my mind, that knowledge workers are fundamentally motivated by a sense of purpose, a sense of autonomy, and a sense of mastery. And that if you get those three things right, uh, you can actually create tremendous uh, energy in your organization and tremendous impact. From With that in mind, I tried to employ that through my uh, different roles at Novartis. And when I got to the CEO uh, ranks, I don't think I necessarily thought of making culture our number one priority. But when I saw the book on Boss uh, on my desk and I had some time to reflect, I thought this could be uh, maybe the thing to lead with for our transformation. Now actually entering year four of my, my journey as, as CEO. And, and what I'd say is while it's been hard, it's not always been easy to make a cultural transformation happen. I think the concept of an unbossed organization, uh, an organization of inspired people, curious about the world and have the freedom to do the work within the guardrails of, of a, any large company in the way they think best, it's created a lot of energy in the organization. Year one was was difficult. Year two and three, we started to get momentum. And now as we enter year four of the transformation, uh, I think people have largely bought in. And in an organization of 110,000 people in 150 countries, uh, that's not a small task to get the buy-in of the organization. But I think it's been successful. And I believe in the long run, will help this company continue its 150-year legacy of, of bringing medicines uh, to patients. Thank you Mario, very much, Miles. Um, now you have 110,000 employees, 50% are millennials. 50% are people who believe in innovation that grew up with sorts of devices that I wasn't able to grow up with. And you set out to become a data science and digital company. You have a digital lighthouse uh, project um, strong innovation culture. Innovation, of course, always happens um, on the edges. It's rarely done top down. Uh, we hire smart people to tell us what to do, as, as great someone quote. else has once said, <laughs> and, and not the other way around. But, but tell us a little bit in your fully diversified medicine company. You produce 50 to 70 million of doses of medicine every year. Uh, with data science and digital, how do you perform both on the production production line and on the innovation line? And then, of course, to see whether you have patient populations with super responders that will give you the edge on the next innovation. But I'm just the the, the theme here is 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 digital and data science, which is everything today, which drives every modern company, and and how it attracts the unbossed 50% millennials and how you carry the the older people and I should say uh, you don't see me here but but you know there are people who are very young and act old and there are older people who are still very young so it's not <laughs> a question of age it's a question of it's mindset. mindset when I took took over as CEO alongside creating an unbossed organization was to go big on, on data and digital in general, healthcare has been a laggard uh, in adopting these technologies, whether you look at the pharmaceutical industry, whether you look at healthcare systems and the delivery of medicine. In general, the deployment of these technologies has lagged in healthcare for a variety of reasons, complex patient privacy concerns, um, fragmentation of systems. You know, what we've tried to do is deploy AI and data science at three levels in the organization. I'd say at different levels of maturity. First, at the basic level is can you what can you automate within an organization? I mean, AI and rules based uh, systems, data science to to really enable you to make smart decisions is something you know we think we we should be systematically bringing to all parts of the organization, whether that's inventory management in the production line or how we run how we run clinical trials. So a lot of energy is spent there. At the next level is can we bring real insights to our people? so that they can make decisions in a, in a more effective way. Uh, there we've deployed large scale technology. So for example, um, within our uh, clinical trials organization, we have a system called Nerve Live that's deployed to 10,000 people, uses predictive analytics and machine learning to predict how our clinical trials are doing, make recommendations on how people should adjust. We're deploying that as well in our manufacturing facilities. Uh, and so we're seeing that start to scale. We partner with, important tech companies like Amazon, 
Microsoft. We also work with Palantir to really enable those technologies to scale. And my vision, my hope is that we can get that to every corner of Novartis. We even have a, a project with Microsoft around AI citizenship. So can we actually get every, can we make AI as simple as Microsoft Excel for all associates at the company? Vision, it's, it's a long way away, but that would be the second broad area of work. The most transformational and, but the most difficult is can you bring AI to fundamentally understanding human biology, drug discovery, and, and ultimately finding new medicines? You'll periodically read in the newspapers about AlphaFold and various parts of Google or Microsoft using huge server farms to solve the problems of protein folding and, uh, and biological systems. That would be the holy grail. We are invested there as well, partnership with Microsoft, uh, as well as a, a few other tech startups. And, and I'm hopeful that in a decade and over the next decade, we might be able to crack that level three in the deployment of AI. But it's worth noting in the first two levels, these are, these are things that happen in many other sectors. I believe they can happen in our company. And I believe ultimately they'll improve the efficiency um, of the organization you know, quite, quite dramatically. So I thank you. I, I can't help it, but of course, being the general counsel and working for a bank, data protection, uh, the rights of clients, the ability to go into it. You know, we would love to have no uh, client identifying data that we couldn't access from anywhere in the world. And frankly, also with some of our peers in order to, for instance, you know, look into AML issues. Now, you know, there is a great advantage for patients, but there must be a counter movement on privacy and other issues and, and not using your valuable time to have sort of a legal discussion, which would be fascinating, but 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 it, it's not there. But how do you actually tell the world um, and, and lead the world to say it is in the better interest to not having to go to the uh, you know New England Journal of Medicine to find something out, but having actual data uh, across patient populations that may be you know, across the entire medical uh, uh, med the world of medicine. The RNA revolution, participating in a massive global collaboration uh, to uh, respond to the crisis, uh, take your company virtual. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether this is your home or is your office, but the, 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 the amazing opportunities with all the crisis in the background in terms of collaboration, developing people, spotting the talent, finding the smartest in your firm and being attractive to the young people, the 50% millennials. A few thoughts on that? Yeah, it's interesting. I think this week is now the one year anniversary from my last uh, business trip, which was actually to, to India. So it's been a, it's been a year since I've really been on the road. Uh, and that has brought on the one hand, frustrations of not being able to connect with our people, connect with customers, connect with uh, stakeholders. But on the flip side, I've never been, I think, closer to my boys. Every meal together with my my two boys who grew up here in, in Basel, spending a lot of time with my wife. We share the home office now. We share the, 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 uh, the, the house together. And uh, that's been remarkable. That's opened up new par parts of me, new possibilities in my own mind. Uh, so I think that's been that's been that's been wonderful, uh, on the, and so that would be on the personal side. I, I need to now reflect as we come out of this pandemic how to retain many of those positive elements in in life going forward. Uh, I think it was a, in some ways a blessing in decide disguise from being a CEO who was traveling more than 50, 60 percent of the time to suddenly being at home to yeah kind of reset a bit, which is which was really good. I think on uh, on the scientific revolution. I, I think we still probably don't reflect enough and it will take time. It'll, it'll take historians to look back on how extraordinary it is. And on the one hand, we had the exponential growth of a virus spreading around the world. And then we had an exponential scientific response that is now leading to some estimates that we could have over maybe, let's see, over 10 billion doses of vaccines produced over the coming, coming year, maybe 12 billion, some estimates I've, I've seen that we've had multiple technologies proved to be scalable and rapidly successful in clinical trials against a, a novel pathogen. We see an explosion of innovation on drugs and diagnostics, clinical trials, industry collaborations, which have never happened. 
I mean, that all happened. It's not even been a year. And I think about the pace of all of that and watching it unfold has been pretty, pretty amazing. I think it shows the power of science, uh, hopefully shows the world that the power of science based progress that we need to recommit ourselves to if we want to tackle future pandemics and even future challenges like climate change. I think from a workforce standpoint, we we stand right now at an interesting moment. I think we've gone through cycles. I think initially there was um, a lot of fear in the system. Then as we rolled out and went virtual, at least in our organization, a lot of energy, we announced we would give people the freedom to work where they want to work, a choice with responsibility approach permanently. Now I think we start to see the erosion of social ties, the, the fatigue of always being on a screen. I just posted to our people today, I know, checking in with everyone and trying to trying to emphasize that people need to take care of themselves in this difficult, difficult time. And now how we come out of that as the vaccines roll out is the next challenge we're going to have to have to manage from an organizational health standpoint. My last question, if you allow, was, of course, you know, a little bit of a prediction on the um, efficacy of the vaccine rollout. Um, uh, when we can return back to some sort of normal, not them sitting in Paris here, where at six o'clock <laughs> you're actually locked in and you cannot go out unless you have a permission by the government. Um, it has a lot of advantages, of course, but but I'm a strong believer in uh, having interpersonal connections and debate and having a beer together. So, you know, just a little sure. bit of a, of a view the way you see it. Of course, I agree with your sentiment. I connected from things that uh, that matter to us, and in the end, there's an incredi incredibly important lesson on humanism here that human beings are ultimately social beings who need to see each other in three dimensions to really feel empathy and compassion. Um, so I think that's an, an important lesson. On the prediction, I'll give you. I, I take a very kind of big picture historical view. I led the Novartis response in 2009 to the H1N1 pandemic. I saw the H5N1 pandemic in 2005. You know, viruses ultimately evolve to try to coexist in their host without actually eliciting any any sort of disease or immune response if they can. Uh, other coronaviruses that circulate today um, cause the cautionary pressures for this virus to try to hide. On, on the other hand, you have the, a massive vaccination scale up and you have population because of the infections that are happening. And my own experience in vaccines, the more you boost, the more diversified your immune responses get, and the, the more able you are to bring an infection under control. Um, and then I think the last dynamic is as we continue to get better therapeutics and better diagnostics and better ability to manage uh, patients, I expect that over the over the coming six months, we'll see a return, uh, more return to normal in terms of healthcare systems, in terms of uh, the basics of life coming back, and then I believe by Q3, Q4, we hopefully can get back to an even more normalcy overall. I don't know. Could be completely wrong. Interestingly, that's the prediction I made uh, in um, April of uh, last year, and uh, it was viewed very negatively by then when I said it by the media. But uh, it seems to be that's where we'll, where we'll end up, and I'm hopeful that that's the case. If not then, I still think by early next year, the scale of the response should help us get to, to a better place. Thank you so much for your outstanding questions. And Vaz, thank you for your great answer. Thank you for your leadership. It's so great to have you on a very busy day, clearly. Also want to thank Bob Jiffer again on a very busy day in New York. He tuned in to, to introduce the program and, and Vaz again. It's, it's been an honor to have you on this program. You're an inspiration to leaders around the world. And we really are so delighted to have had you with us. We hope you